Nicole, how was the contact first made? Did it come through Sidney Pollack and Tom to you for the offer from Stanley to do Eyes Wide Shut? Um, he actually sent me the script. He was having a whole conversation through fax with uh, Tom, which I wasn't that aware of, you know. I mean, I, I knew that Kubrick was talking to him and stuff, but I wasn't. They'd been faxing each other for well over a year. And I was in the middle of doing Portrait of a Lady, actually finishing it, so I was in London. And I got this call saying Stanley wants to send you. It was Stanley's assistant saying he wants to send a script, where shall we send it? And there's a letter. And um, I was stunned. <laughs> and, he sa and they said, and you've got to make sure that you'll be at the house at this particular time to receive it and everything. And I said, okay, okay. And he sent me this letter, which I've kept, which I've subsequently got filed, that said, I'd love you to play Alice Harford. I think you'd be perfect in the role. Please read it. Make sure you're sitting down when you read it. You're not distracted. You're rested. And um, call me and tell me what you think. And and that was basically what happened. Had Tom read it at that point or mm. not? It came to you rather than to Tom. No, it came to him as well. He he got a copy of the script as well. So, and then I heard from my agent that Stanley had been calling for that for about nine months for different tapes of my work and had been seeing things and and so obviously he'd I had no idea and my agent hadn't told me because it wasn't a job offer or anything it was just sort of interest I think um, and that's how obviously he he that's how it evolved D uh, did you have the make the private journey to St Albans to meet and talk to him then? yes what was your first impression of him when you met him I remember thinking well, he's sort of scruffy, <laughs> and uh, and he had uh, he was wearing um, a jacket, and he had the most extraordinary eyes you've ever seen on a human being. I think would be the perfect way, and his daughter has those eyes too. Um, but they're hooded eyes. Um, and they look at you, and they have this quite mischievous quality, and yet they're very. Um, they just have, they have a great sense of having lived. And his eyes. did you get the feeling that he was seeing things in you that other people hadn't seen? No, I was just terrified that he was going to fire me. I was thought he was going to take oh, one look at me and say, well, oh gosh, what was I thinking? This woman is not right for the role. Um, and, um, and say, look, we've got to part ways. I, I, I had that fear for about the first month um, of knowing him because I was very nervous around him, partly because I was so in awe of him, and then, um, and then just because I have in the film very big monologues, two very big monologues, that um, I thought were going to be very, very difficult, and I thought if he ever sees me do them, he's not going to want me in the film. So, <laughs> so there's my insecurities as an actor. But over the, over the course of time, I became so confident with him. I mean, he just gave me such confidence as an actor and, and really allowed me such freedom as an actor. He would say, OK, you've done a few takes. Now you can just do what you want to do. And, and I'd heard all these stories about him being incredibly controlling and not wanting this and not wanting that. And at certain times he was very controlling. At other times he was pleased just, uh, and particularly with the monologues, is when he allowed me just to really just get lost in Alice. And I think that's what happened. I mean, over the course of the year and a half, I just, you know, became that woman. You became her. I mean, it in is... In a weird way. I mean, I know that sounds... Um, ridiculous, because obviously I am who I am, but you know, as an actor, you set up, there's reality and there's pretend, and those lines get crossed. And it happens um, when you're working with a director that allows that to happen. And it's a very exciting thing to happen. It's a very dangerous thing to happen as well. Um, and when it does happen, I think that's when um, the work becomes it becomes so much more than just making a film. You see, this must be a lifetime experience. You probably will ne never make a film under these circumstances again, like no. this, will no. you? 
No. And it's probably still very fresh in your mind. You probably need some years to recall what it was actually like. Mm -hmm. What I'd like to hear from you, though, is I, I'm not interested in, you know, the, the stories about 50 takes. Mm -hmm. I understand why you went to 50 takes. And sometimes didn't. What you I know. <laughs> sure. So it was always, it was very unpredictable. It was what? always unpredictable. What I'd like to know from you, though, is what what you were feeling as a person and as an actor as he took you beyond what anybody would say would be an ordinary number of attempts at a, at a particular piece of performance? I think you go through all sorts of emotions. I mean, you, um, Stanley always was waiting for something to happen. And he wasn't as interested in, as, he wasn't as interested in naturalistic acting as he was in something that for whatever reason surprised him or um, piqued his interest. That's when he would go, ah, okay, now we're on to something. And he was always interested in exploring things, um, whether they were, that there was no right and wrong in relation to making a film, a performance. Um, it wasn't about, well, this is the right way to do it and this is the wrong way to do it. It was about exploring all, all facets of it so that then he could go into the editing room and edit it. That's what I perceive it as. So as an actor, you, it, you, as long as you relaxed into the situation and said, okay, I, I'm going to go with this, then it, then it was the most wonderful experience because you were able, you didn't ever walk away from the set feeling, oh, I didn't get it. Oh, if only. If only you'd let me have one more, maybe we would have discovered something. He made sure that he discovered everything there was to discover in the material. Did you find yourself surprising <clears throat> yourself mm -hmm. with new things? It's, uh, by doing a lot of takes and also by being so close to him and to Tom, um, I was constantly surprising myself, but I was very relaxed. So a lot of the time when the cameras were on, I wasn't even aware, you know, you, the awareness of all the, um, the other things like people standing around and booms and cameras and stuff was to the point where I, I wouldn't even notice it. I wouldn't even think about it. Um, which is a really difficult situation to get into. When you do it on a film for a small amount of time, it requires extraordinary concentration, and a lot of the time you don't achieve it because you're still aware, and you always have a feeling of, oh, I wish I'd just been able to try something else. Whereas with Stanley, you get to the stage where you don't notice any of it. Partly, partly you're tired, <laughs> which is actually a very good thing sometimes when you're acting, because it means that it, you're not trying to produce emotions or trying to be this or thinking this is how it should be. It just happens and just sort of comes out of you. Um, it's very hard to explain. It's something that only a small number of people who have worked with Stanley understand, but it's almost like a club because when you meet and it, it's editors, it's production designers, it's DP, it's whoever has worked with him and experienced his intensity and his passion for filmmaking. They're the only people that truly understand it, and can, other actors. Can I ask you about a couple of scenes, because our time's limited? Mm. The scene where things start to go wrong mm. between you and your husband in the film is mm -hmm. after you smoke pot, mm. and it's, Christiana has, has spoken to me a lot about this, mm. and her, her interpretation is that this careless mm. talk threatens the marriage. Mm. It's actually the pot has taken you the wrong way. It could have mm. taken you one way, sexy and happy. It took you the other way. Well, that's what I think so honest about that is that Bill thinks, okay, we're going to have sex now. He's re all settling in for the night, and um, he says one thing. It happens to be the wrong thing, and it triggers a number of reactions from me, which is so real. I mean, this happens to all of us in our relationships or, you know, in our marriages at different times where, and you, and you see Bill sort of reeling from it. I think it's a very funny scene. I love Stanley's humour, so, and it really comes across in that scene, and then he takes it into that dangerous territory of where I am just spewing things, saying things um, that I have held back for so long that just sort of happened to come out at this particular time on this particular night and um, 
I find that fascinating but so real. Do you think that character mm. you were playing had the self-awareness to know that she was threatening everything? No. no way. No, but I think subconsciously she wanted she wanted something more from her husband. She loves him. She still loves him. She wants to be with him. But she's she's searching for something more. We debated this scene a lot, Stanley and I. And um, and he, he would say to me, Nicole, you should be a lawyer. Because I would debate e ish, each issue of the scene and each is issue of Alice's arguments. Um, and and sometimes I'd find flaws in her argument. And I would say, but hold on, no, no, we've got to fix this because, because I wanted to be right, you know? And he said, the key thing here is, Nicole, you're stoned. There is no rational, it's not even a rational argument. You're not standing up in the court of law and having to um, be, everything is perfect. He said, when people argue, they say the most ridiculous things. At other times, they say the most profound things. They, at times, they're right on course with their line of argument, and other times, they veer off and sound ridiculous. And that's what I love about the argument, is that it is completely irrational at times. <laughs> and that's what makes it funny as well. Well, and um, and then when she's uh, my favourite moment is when I would just start to laugh. I just loved doing that, where I just break down laughing, uh, which then segues into this whole story about this man that I fantasised about. There are two acting mm. moments I must ask you about. Mm. One is where you're asleep and mm. you're laughing. I mean, they're both extraordinary acting moments. I'd like you to help us understand how you would, apart from your natural talent, achieve this with Stanley's help. That laughter when you're asleep seemed to be an absolutely genuine laugh of pleasure, mm. which is interrupted, mm. and then becomes a nightmare. Mm. What was it that you'd agreed that you were laughing at at that moment? Um, um, we, I mean, a lot of stuff that Stanley, Stanley didn't like you talking about, you know, the things. He, it was, um, the imagery of the dream. It was being lost completely in the imagery of the dream. And he was very particular about the type of laugh. And I remember we did a, quite a lot of takes just on the beginning. He would cut it early if he didn't feel that it was, um, the perfect sound that he wanted to hear at that time. It was a kind of out of control. Controlled yeah, it's laugh. a weird laugh. I know. I find it quite weird when I watch it because I, I mean, I've only seen the movie twice to date, um, but I find it quite disturbing and and um, I find the whole film like that. It's very hard for me to sit down and watch it. After he says, "I'll tell you everything," mm. there's a cut to you. You've been crying for hours. You're mm. smoking. How did you achieve that? I cried for hours. <laughs> I've never seen a transformation like that, and mm. so brilliantly held. Yeah, I mean, I just, Stanley, I mean, that was the thing, time, we didn't have to worry about time, so to prepare for that, I just went and cried. When I talked to Stanley, and, uh, and my face looks, I look at that and I go, oh my gosh, I look so ravaged. <laughs> um, but. I love that I look ravaged because, you know, a lot of times you're kind of rushing and you can't quite, they, they, we don't have time, or come on, just hurry up. He gave me the time. What was your, and I just, uh, I'm sorry mm, to sorry. interrupt you because we're under a great mm. time pressure and I, I'd love to talk to you mm. for half an hour, it'd be fascinating. Mm. What was your immediate reaction when you heard that he died? Um, shock and I didn't believe it and I didn't want to believe it because it just seemed wrong didn't seem like the right time he seemed to have too many other things to do and say and it's still very um, sorry <laughs> I'll, I'll move from that just for a second. You 
spent you deliberately spent a lot of, I'm sorry to bring that no, up. No, it's you. all right. Um, <laughs> you de you spent a lot of time with him deliberately. Yeah. Didn't you? Yeah. Um, do you want a hanky? It's fine. <laughs> uh, uh, and you learnt a lot. And I have the feeling that he became a sort of a father figure for you, professionally speaking, and probably, in a sense, personally as well. What did you learn from him? What could you pass on to us? What that time that you spent with him now must seem enormously valuable to you. What did it mean to you that time? Um, I think it changed the way I view films, the way I view filmmaking. It gave me a belief in the purity of filmmaking and the art form of making a film and that however long it takes um, whatever you have to go through you're making a film and it's extraordinary and wonderful and and a lot of the times now I think people view films in a very business way we have a product we've got to get it out for summer we've got to make the film it's got to be this it's got to be that and and it's the filmmaking isn't that it's about getting lost in in that world and and it's exquisite when it happens what you're saying actually is that what I've always believed, and most of us have, that film is an art at its highest level. Yeah, and that, and that a lot of the times now you can really um, question that, and, and particularly as an actor you can be corrupted, I think, even as a director. Um, but, but it's... I mean, Stanley Kubrick was someone that dedicated his life to making films, and he believed in that art form in such a pure way and he lived films he loved films and a lot of the time we can say oh that's pretentious or oh well you know there's so many other more important things in the world and yes there is but the great storytellers of our past and our are, are also and of now are so important to our future and I think Stanley gave me a belief in that again he Did was one of the great storytellers of all time and he used film as his medium to do that and it was beautiful.